Good afternoon or evening, depending on your time zone, and welcome on behalf of uh, the American Physical Society. Uh, I'm Matt Thompson, the current chair of the APS Forum on Industrial Applied Physics. Uh, by night and by day, I'm Director of Systems Engineering at Zap Energy Incorporated. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you to Broadening Our Community, our final panel discussion of the day. This is a topic of uh, special importance to me. It's near and dear to my heart as a, one of the majority of physicists whose goals and aspirations are a little more directed towards in, uh, industry, uh, as well as someone who mentors a lot of younger physicists whose goals may not neatly align with the role of an academic researcher. Um, and it was also all of this is a, was a driver in some of my previous work with the APS, uh, including the creation of the Impact Mentoring Program with Stephen Lambert a few years ago. And today we're going to continue in that vein. We're going to talk about who a physicist is, what it actually means to do physics, uh, why we do physics, um, and all of that in the broader context of how we can have a more uh, inclusive uh, physics community. Uh, we've heard from a lot of different folks today, leading experts, scientists on various topics. Um, but of course, by necessity, it's a bit of a limited viewpoint um, and not every voice in our community. So we're trying to uh, do better. Um, all voices and all perspectives across disciplines, um, as well as all other categories. And so this is uh, a next step in that noble journey. Um, and I'd like to introduce the moderator for this uh, session, Ben Zwickel. Uh, ben is an associate professor in the School of Physics and Astronomy at Rochester Institute of Technology uh, and has a wide variety of interests, uh, broad concerns about career development, everything from communication skills in STEM uh, through entrepreneurship and issues related to PhD admission and completion. Uh, he earned his PhD in physics from Yale University and please welcome me and helping me and welcome uh, Ben Zwickel. All right, thank you, Matt, for that introduction. And I look forward to this session. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so in terms of a few of the expectations for today, throughout the entire panel discussion, you can utilize the Q&A box uh, that should be on the, the platform for the conference. And uh, don't use the chat, try to use the Q&A box to submit your questions. And throughout that, uh, the, whole, the whole panel today, Crystal Bailey, head of uh, career programs at APS is gonna be monitoring that. And Crystal is gonna act like a co-moderator for our session today. So at times, Crystal will just interject right into the discussion with something that she pulls from the Q&A and we'll just weave it right into the conversation. So uh, we'll, try to, we'll try to answer, get as many of your questions answered as possible, as well as you know, kind of follow an overall outline for our discussion today. Uh, it will be hopefully a fairly free and open back and forth discussion between our panelists. And uh, so, it, you know, I, I, to bio about each of them, I'm going to just ask them to unmute and say hello. Uh, hey, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, Ben. Uh, okay. Sorry, I had a little technical d glitch there. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That, that was an internet instability. Uh, that, that wiped out Zoom. So uh, I'm glad to be back uh, with you all and that it wasn't m much more of an inter interruption than that. So, our, so each of our panelists will unmute, inter uh, just briefly say hi to you. And, uh, and then we'll get into the kind of the framing of the session and then some of the questions. So our, our first panelist, Kathy Adala, is the Kennedy Shalkanoff Professor of Physics and Director of the Fimble Maker and Innovation Lab at Mount Holyoke College. She completed her undergraduate degree with a double major in applied physics and psychology from Yale University. And um, she did her um, uh, PhD in applied physics from Harvard. Sorry, one second. I need to reshare my uh, slides. Can you see those now? 
Okay. So yeah. So um, all right. So uh, Kathy also teaches a seminar course in gender and science and is founder of the SciTech Cafe, holding monthly events that bring scientists into an informal setting to discuss their work with the general public. Uh, our next speaker, Megan Anzelk, is head of data and analytics at Spencer Stewart. Prior to joining Spencer Stewart, Dr. Anzelk held a number of leadership roles in data and analytics in the insurance industry, most recently serving as chief analytics officer for Axis Capital. Dr. Anzelk holds a master's and PhD in physics from Northwestern University and a bachelor's in physics from Loyola University, Chicago. Our next uh, panelist, Tabitha Dobbins, is currently professor. Oh, sorry, I have forgot to let people uh, just unmute and say hi. Kathy, can you just say hi to everyone? everybody. Happy to be here. Okay. And Megan, can you do likewise? Hi, everyone. Glad to be with you. All right. Thanks. Um, and so our, our third panelist, uh, Tabitha Dobbins, is currently professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, VP for Research and Dean of the Graduate School at Rowan University. Her research programs are aimed at attracting and recruiting top students to the sciences using societally relevant energy-related and biomedical-related topics. She continues to do cutting-edge research in applying synchrotron X-ray and neutron analysis to modern engineering problems in carbon nanotubes, gold nanoparticles, the hydrogen fuel economy, Economy and polymer self-assembly. Dobbins has also served on the American Institute of Physics Task Force for Underrepresentation of African Americans in Physics from 2017 to 2019, and she currently serves on the African Light Source Executive Steering Committee and the APS Forum on the International Physics Executive Committee. Can you say hi to everyone, Tabitha? Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. All right. Thanks so much. Our fourth panelist, Zara Husseini, is a senior software reliability engineer at Waymo, an autonomous driving and technology company that started as Google's self-driving car project. She earned BS degrees in physics and mathematics from Arizona State University in 2013, and she started her career as a research assistant studying carbon nanotube nucleation and growth at the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Zara, can you say hi? Hi, everyone. Looking forward to the session. Yep, thank you. And finally, our last panelist, Larry Wolf, is a materials physicist and technical fellow at General Atomics Aeronautical Systems Inc. in San Diego. He received a PhD in low temperature condensed matter physics from the University of California, San Diego in 1980, and a BA from Rutgers College before that. After a postdoctoral appointment at the Exxon Corporate Research Science Laboratory, Wolf joined General Atomics in 1982. Wolf has served in several roles in the APS Forum on Education, APS Committee on Education, and the FIS 21 Report. And he is currently playing a role in the Effective Practices for Physics Programs, EP3 Task Force. So welcome all of our panelists, uh, a great variety of backgrounds with a tremendous amount of experience in academics and industry and, and different issues related to broadening our community. So before we get started with the questions to prompt the panelists, I want to frame a few big issues. And when we think about the, the meaning of broadening our community, we're really going to talk about that in two senses. The first is broadening the career paths of a physicist. And so that's going to take on this career focus, thinking about academia and industry and how those are similar and different. Uh, we're also going to talk about broadening our community in the sense of diversity, equity, and inclusion in physics. And what I think we'll see is that oftentimes those two considerations are not separate. Like they're actually linked in many ways. And so I think this is going to be a rich discussion for today. So in terms of that first idea about broadening our community in terms of career paths, we've got one slide with it with a graph. And you know, the, the big question is, you know, uh, does pursuing a non-academic career mean leaving the physics community? And what this graph is showing is that the initial employment of most of our graduates, whether it's at the BS level, which is blue, or MS in green, or the PhD grads in yellow, are going into the private sector. And so the private sector or industry is playing a really significant role in the future careers of students in our community. And, you know, why does it matter whether or not we consider these people going off into the private sector part of our community as physics community? Well, in part, it, it matters to APS because it means maintaining engagement with physicists who go off and, and work in these different industries. And it also, I think, plays a role in thinking about how our own students envision their careers. Like, what does it mean to be a physicist, to be a physics major? What opportunities are available? So that's going to be one element we'll explore. 
The other is this broad topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion in physics. And I want to specifically point out the AIP Team Up project, which uh, culminated in the Team Up report, which was released in 2020. And you can find that if you just Google AIP Team Up Task Force, you're going to find it, the links down there at the bottom. But uh, it is a very thorough investigation of the reasons for persistent underrepresentation of African Americans in physics and astronomy, along with a number of uh, recommendations that can be made practically for departments to improve representation. So uh, we are going to weave some of the expertise of uh, that went into that um, report also into our conversation today. And, and where do we see the intersection? Well, I, this is just a, a snapshot of some of the key findings of the team up report. And um, the first, just you know, regarding how we define successful members of the physics community, uh, finding 2A, right? Faculty encouragement and recognition are key enablers of physics identity for African American students, right? So this issue of who gets counted as a physicist is one we really need to consider deeply. Uh, recommendation 4D, right? Faculty should strive to understand that students do not leave behind their identity and experiences when entering the classroom and should recognize the unique promise of each student from a perspective of strengths rather than weaknesses. What things do we value in a physicist, right? Who, what, do we, what, what identities do we, do we see as physicists? What's, what things do we value in physicists? And then in terms of social impact and career preparation, right? Departments should communicate the ways in which a physics degree empowers graduates to improve their society and benefit their communities. And 2E, that there should be a discussion of a broad range of career options. Uh, and then finally, we're thinking about the financial realities of college. The, the earnings matter, right? It's because financial stress is particularly high for, for many college students, but particularly for African-American students uh, and uh, for many African-American students. And then student retention uh, drastically improves when faculty recognize that students are, you know, have these unique and intersecting social identities. Uh, they could be a first generation college student. They could be working to support a family, um, but, but they are, they are a, a you know, we're all interesting people. And so it's really this intersection of identities that we want to recognize. So, uh, so these are just some of the findings from the team up report, which I think will play a role in our discussion. I wanted to put that out there. So it's in the back of your mind as you're listening. All right. So again, as was said in the opening, we're going to be talking about these three big questions. Who is a physicist? What does a physicist do? And why do we do physics? And we're going to hopefully have a, a lively examination of those three things uh, throughout the next hour and 15. Okay, so let's get started. As a reminder, you can use that Q&A box on Slido on the, the platform to post your questions and look forward to those as they come in. So this is the first question to the panel, um, and feel free to just unmute and pop in when, you know, to build off someone else's answer or uh, to just contribute a, a different perspective. Uh, but this is the, the space we want to start in. Did you ever question your title as a physicist? Do you still use that as a descriptor for your, uh, you know, for how you identify yourself to others? And in your career path, did you ever feel concerned that you were leaving the physics community or why might someone else think that who was considering an industry career? So that, that's where we're going to start. And, uh, you know, feel free to tackle any one of those. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you. So um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and get started. I, I, I would say that um, the... I did not see myself as a physicist, even though my bachelor's degree was in physics until I got all the way uh, to my postdoc and in and, and the postdoc sort of in the application and the in the personnel records, you had a title. And so that's the, the when I was given a title was when I uh, sort of considered myself a physicist. And that that was that was a unique I can actually remember that. And I'm wondering now why I didn't think of myself as a physicist prior or, or, and I, I think I thought of myself somewhat as a as scientist. I went into material science for my um, master's and PhD, but, but really, um, really it wasn't until I was given a formal title and I still use it. Oh well, yeah. Thanks Tabitha. Uh, I, I've always felt myself as a physicist from, you know, since I had an undergraduate degree in physics and graduate school, I will say, and I felt like a physicist, I always, I, well, I still identify, self-identify as a physicist. 
Uh, and I think my colleagues who are, all, I have many physics colleagues, people who had got degrees in physics at uh, my company, who all identify themselves as physicists, regardless of if they're doing any, anything physics related or not. But I, I will say that um, it's, you do feel a little bit different when you stop publishing papers and going to conferences because there's, there's much less of a link to the APS and to the community of academic physicists when you're in industry and you're no longer doing academic type stuff, you do, there is a disconnection. I know when I've been at APS meetings and I have no one to kind of hang out with because everyone is with their fellow grad students or professor. So um, it, it's, uh, I do still feel a physicist, but it, like I said, at, at APS meetings, oftentimes I, I did feel a little bit like not part of the mainstream. Yeah, thanks Larry. I can offer a different perspective. So I, I don't think of myself as a physicist. I think of myself as a software engineer, um, but it's really important to me to still be connected to the physics community because I absolutely credit my physics education for all of the critical thinking and creative and analytic skills that I do use at my job, even though they're not like the work I do is not related to the laws of physics, it's, an, it's a totally different problem, but I think it's the same parts of my brain that I'm using and things that I learned from my physics education. Yeah. So Zara, I was wondering, just building off what Tabitha had said about, you know, getting that job title, uh, was there a link for you between job title and, you know, identifying is that profession or how, what was the relationship there for you? I think so. I don't think I ever, um, so I only briefly worked, I guess, as a physicist, I spent one year after my undergrad working, um, doing physics research at NIST. And during that year, I did consider myself a physicist. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, my job title is software engineer. And so that's what I am. And I'm not doing physics. I'm not talking to my coworkers about physics, but I still care very much about physics. It's part of my identity. I don't think it's part of my professional identity though. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe I can just add a little bit of, I, I consider it part of my identity, but not sort of my primary. So I think over time, I've started describing myself as um, trained as a physicist or that my background is as a physicist. Um, I do think the other sort of part of your question, Ben, about leaving physics, that was a question and a topic as I was considering um, what to do after graduate school. Uh, so that was, and to some extent, it was almost predetermined. I, I did the PhD thinking I was going to become like a staff scientist at Fermilab where I did my dissertation work. Um, I never wanted to be a professor. That wasn't why I did the PhD. Um, and so as I was thinking about what I was going to do next, and as the idea of a staff scientist became less and less probable, um, uh, you know, the idea of leaving physics was, was something that came up with, with myself and my advisor and the other grad students around me. It's also one of the most common questions I get asked by students as I do a lot of career type events about other career paths for people with STEM backgrounds uh, and physics degrees specifically. People ask about, you know, did, was that heartbreaking? Do you feel like you shouldn't have studied physics? Um, you know, are you intellectually stimulated by the work that you do as though nothing but physics could be intellectually challenging. And that is very much not true. Um, so it is a question I think that comes up and definitely I think there's sort of a, if not a stigma, then a bias towards thinking that academic physics sort of is quote unquote physics. Um, and that if you aren't doing that, you somehow aren't a physicist. So I think that that viewpoint is held by a range of people, including students, right? Undergrads and grad students. Yeah. Yeah, you know, from, uh, yeah, did anyone else uh, who's kind of pursued, you know, a path that at least at a time has maybe led them outside of academia ever have a sense of, uh, you know, leaving the physics community and whether or not that was a concern? I, I related to a lot of what Megan said, especially when you said, like, as the prospect of being an, uh, like a, a staff scientist for you, but like an academic physicist for me, like became less and less probable. Um, that absolutely played into my decision to, to pursue industry um, over something more traditional. Yeah. Did you feel you were supported in that uh, decision or how, how did that come about? It was mixed. Um, so I think I had um, some of my supervisors and mentors around me 
like express sadness, you know, because they see like, oh, you have this promising, you know, academic career and, and um, the language they were using was like, oh, you're throwing this away to go pursue something else. Um, and, you know, that, you know, had an emotional reaction in me. Like I felt a little bit at the time, like, like I was letting go and, you know, failing in some ways to go do this other thing that wasn't as prestigious and wasn't as like, you know, prestigious, I guess is the word. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Any other, any other reflections that just anyone on the panel has on this topic of who's a physicist, the title, and, and maybe some of the 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 biases in our community that might kind of make a, a clean separation kind of between those who are within and without. Yeah, Tabitha. Yeah, I just, I, I'm not to ask questions of the other panelists, but a question comes to mind, Zara, with your last statement, not as prestigious, did, did, did at the time, did, did those comments make it feel like your, your choice was not as important or did you always see software engineering as, as important? So at, what I found important changed a lot. Um, I think to give you a sense of how the breadth of, of my interests, I think I had six different majors in, in four years of college. Um, everything is cool. Everything is exciting. Like, it's a shame that you can't do everything. And so I was like changing direction, like, oh, I'm going to be a chemist. Oh, no, I'm going to be a physicist. Maybe I'll be a mathematician. And like, it was all, you know, just bubbling and boiling inside of me. Like I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but then after spending a year doing actual research, um, I learned that, that that probably wasn't for me. Um, the field seemed really competitive in ways that I didn't want to, to take on. Um, and so like at the time that I, that I left academia and joined industry, I absolutely felt like it was the right thing for me to do. Um, and that it was important for me and that I was going to get more of what I wanted from this other career. Yeah. Um, um, okay. Can, yeah. Can I, can I jump in for one second, just really quick? Okay. You saw, yeah, some folks yeah. are asking to have the, the screen not shared so they can see everyone's face. So thanks. <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that sounds good. Crystal, do you know, is there, uh, would it be possible for me to make a, a smaller window that's shared and have people be bigger or is it just going to be one size fits all? Uh, I really like it's always going to be the same size, no matter what. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what the okay. solution is. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, I kind of wanted to, to make those visible, um, but uh, uh, just, just to kind of keep the prompts in our minds, but uh, I'll, I'll switch back and forth. All right. So. Um, yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Tabitha, for that follow-up question. If we have any more uh, like that, like if just someone says something that you want to build off of, let's just keep that as part of the format. I mean, I, I think that makes for the richest discussion. Um, all right, so I am going to reshare right now. And uh, I want to talk now about this idea of broadening what physicists do. And this was hinted at maybe a little bit in some of the previous discussion, uh, but in your own physics education, did it seem like some kinds of activities were real physics while other parts were not real physics? I think that could extend into your, your current work that you're doing, um, you know, in terms of like, do, do you consider what you're doing now physics? Uh, and, um, you know, what would be the real part of physics maybe you're doing or you're not doing? Uh, in what ways might we broaden the concept of what a physicist does, right? So we could broaden our definition of real physics and how might that impact the physics curriculum and what or how we teach? So that's kind of the big space of questions. I will, uh, I will stop sharing and I'm going to stick those in the internal chat so the speakers can see those while we're we're going. So that way you can talk and, uh, and also still reflect back on those. Oh, so I guess uh, oh, sort of, go ahead, Larry. No, no I'm fine. I was oh. just going to sort of take it to Ben's second point around, um, 
how does it sort of relate to your own career? Um, and, and one of the things that I found very fascinating when I finished my PhD and moved into a career doing data science and predictive modeling for an insurance company um, is that it was actually almost exactly like the work I had been doing in graduate school. It was just on a different domain data set. So the idea of figuring out how to pull data together, how to clean it, how to prepare it for analysis, how to run iterative analysis on it, collaborate with others, all of that was identical. I was just using a different programming language and my inputs were insurance data. Um, so I think there's a lot of really strong ties with a lot of career paths uh, that are not considered sort of traditional physics. Um, and I don't, I haven't used my own physics domain knowledge very much, but I think similar to some others on the panel that have alluded to, I use the training I receive every single day in some way, shape or form. Larry, I'll let you take over. Yeah, I mean, uh, for myself, I mean, there's always a germ of physics in everything I do and maybe 5% of the work I do. And the rest of it is, you know, figuring out how to, how to do a literature survey or do a, you know, analyze data or set up experiments or set up development of how to develop a new product. There's always a germ of physics in everything I do. On the other hand, for some people, there's more physics and more, maybe some, a lot of optical engineering or something like that. There may be some people who are physicists in my company who do almost no physics. It's just, they're really good at, at thinking about complex problems and how to organize complex problems, which is something a physics degree does help you with. But I mean, I think the range of physics used in industry by physicists in industry ranges from, you know, zero to near a hundred percent. And, but it's all those other skills that are, for example, spelled out in the Phys 21 report, you know, the scientific and technical skills besides the physics skills, uh, communication skills, professional skills, all those things are things that we all, we all use all the time. And so those are, those are the commonalities of, uh, you know, what a physicist does in industry, which again, is often not physics. And it's certainly very different in general from what, um, you know, what academic physicists do. I mean, there used to be more overlap when there were places like Bell Labs and IBM Basic Research and GE Research, where people in industry did similar things to what people in academia did. But I think that's, uh, you know, that's very rare in, the, in this day and age. So talking from the perspective of um conversations I have with my students. Um, it's fascinating to me, the preconceptions that they come to college with about what is physics, because it's not, we, the department haven't even had time to influence them yet. Um, so it's, you know, cosmology and string theory and particles and maybe quantum, quantum gets a lot of attention these days. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, my department, we're very small, liberal arts college, um, has a lot more um, applied folks. Um, Two of us have actually degrees from engineering schools, um, but we end up with, we, we were interviewing uh, biophysicists and we actually had students saying, yeah, but that's not physics. Like I'd be a bio major if I wanted to do that. And we had to, like it led to good conversations about, um, <laughs> no, no, we, like what are the tools of physics? How many areas can we apply that to, let alone finance, economics, um, social science, like all sorts of messy systems that we, we take our, our education and the skills that we're, we're teaching our students, but they're actually get having preconceived notions before they, they come to college. Um, and it's something that we, like, I'm not actually worried about pulling more people into the major who are in love with cosmology and they're gonna go find physics and astronomy no matter what school they're in. I'm worried about the students who don't realize that the physics um, uh, the way of learning physics and the, the things that we teach you in physics can be applied super broadly. Um, but like where this preconceived notion comes from um, is actually not just uh, the academic physicists creating more of themselves, right? It's coming from even before they get there. Yeah, so uh, I, I was really fascinated by a couple of the comments uh, that have been made so far one was this idea that like the physics domain knowledge uh, is the real physics, you know? So I guess if we were to kind of synthesize some of the discussion, like the real physics would be like the electricity and magnetism, the condensed matter stuff, the quantum stuff, the string theory, you know? And, and then as soon as you start to talk about a practice that maybe physicists do all the time, like data analytics uh, of some kind, 
That's not physics because, well, you could apply it to economics or you could apply it to finance. And I find that to be like a fascinating uh, distinction between kind of what, what is real physics and what is not, in part because I see other disciplines like engineering uh, through their ABET accreditation um, for, for better or for worse, right? ABET accreditation includes a pretty broad swath of things in, in what it means to define an engineering program. And that does include communication skills and other things. So, uh, you know, it's almost like they say, like, we're going to define the engineering discipline to include these things. And yet there seems to be this almost in instinctual response within the, the physics curriculum to, to kind of distinguish between the, the real physics, which is like domain knowledge, something that has physics in the title, and then these broader, more applicable skills. I don't know. Uh, does anyone have any reflections on that or in their personal experiences as an educator or a researcher or scientist? I would, I would say that um, for the um, freshmen coming in and, and opting to major in physics, um, many of them don't know for sure what they want their career path to look like. And so I think it would be important to um, to emphasize inside of the curriculum that the skill set that you're you're gaining as you pursue uh, this degree is 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 very broadly applicable to these other areas, and to be to be very deliberate about that message. Yeah, that's a great point. I I almost wonder like why Megan can't say. I'm, I'm doing physics in the insurance industry, <laughs> like, <laughs> rather than just being like saying, oh, I'm taking a few things I learned from physics and, and doing that in the insurance industry. It, it's a bit of messaging in a way, but I think it kind of, it, it does have to do with this issue of like, who do we include in our community and who do we not? Um, well, I, I think we have to consider that physics has distinctions from chemistry and material science and biology, right? And those distinctions make physics a unique um, discipline. So, you know, I think it's okay to say certain things are very spe specifically physics. On the other hand, there's all the other things, you know, the general technical skills and communication skills and professional skills that are broadly applicable to all science and engineering disciplines, which is why physicists can do pretty much anything, which is also true why many in the engineering and other aspects can do, you know, a lot of different things too, because we all have a, a common set of experimental skills and analytical skills, organizational skills, data analysis skills. So, but, but I mean, there is a kernel that is uniquely physics. So I think it's, it's okay to identify that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with Larry that there are these things that are physics, but I think what makes a physics education really cool is that it trains you for so much more than just being a physicist. Yeah, those are great, uh, great reflections. Um, I'm going to jump back to the slideshow now and yeah, so the next broad set of things I want to talk about is the idea of making a difference with a physics degree. And Tabitha, one of the things I really appreciated about your bio was that you explicitly called out wanting students to understand the connections to important societal problems through the, the research you do. And, uh, you know, I think the, some context for this is, I think was already brought up a bit. You know, many physicists pursue physics because of a sense of wonder and curiosity. And I think all of those undergraduates that enter a physics degree, even before we've talked to them, and they think, uh, you know, string theory, they think cosmology, right? It's about wonder and curiosity and how the world works. But uh, from work that I've done in my own research, and I think it resonates with what we know about kind of the coming generation of students, that, that just many students and even uh, current professionals want to see their work impact others, their community and the environment. And, you know, what are some ways we can, you know, really not pit those things against each other, but see them kind of both together. And so, uh, so the prompts are, you know, in your own personal stories, how have these two values, curiosity and making a difference played a role in your career path? And what might a physics curriculum looks like that look like that values both of these things? So that'll be our prompt for this phase of the discussion. This second bullet point on the slide of wanting to see your work impact society is absolutely why I joined industry. I was um, having a really hard time seeing direct connections between the research work I was doing and, you know, someone's life improving. 
Um, it's the kind of thing where I think you need a particular, you know, mindset of like, it's okay if all the papers I publish, if their real world impact happens well after I die. Um, I think doing academic research or any kind of research is, is a very, it, its impacts to society are, are on a longer scale. Um, and I think this just depends on, on each individual's motivation and, and what makes them excited about their work. Um, and I learned via doing research that what made me excited about my work was, was a bit more near-term impact. Um, and I think that's something that industry provides, you know, and today I get to work on building infrastructure for like hopefully obsoleting human drivers and making roads safer, which is, which is a shorter term thing. Um, and it's still doing something that humanity has never done before. So it has that in common with research. Um, but I think research usually takes a much longer view of things. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I was of a very similar mindset when I was finishing my PhD and looking at career paths of, you know, the idea of waiting decades to see a societal impact um, was too long of a time frame for me. I wanted to do something where I could, um, I also like the idea of seeing things from beginning to end, right? So from project sort of ideation and initiation all the way through to like implementation and impact and then measuring that impact. Um, and so that's where talking to other physicists who had moved outside of academia um, was a way for me to kind of learn about those timescales and how people manage to do that in different careers. But I completely agree. That was a big part of, of my search as well. And then to the curiosity piece, I think similar to you, um, a lot of pretty much all of the work that I have done since then has been still solving problems using data uh, and math that are, haven't been answered before. So I actually am still in the different careers um, and different industries I've worked in since my PhD, I am still adding new knowledge to the world. Now that knowledge isn't published, it's turned into business products instead, right, that have some other sort of mechanism for having impact on society. Um, but all of the work, the work I do now is all people analytics, right, and predicting things about what people can do in their careers and what that looks like. Uh, that is new knowledge. People don't have the answers to the questions we're trying to answer. Um, so it's still very, very similar sort of in spirit uh, to the idea of discovery and curiosity and innovation. So I couldn't agree more with you. I, I, I could totally agree with Megan and Zara. Everything they said, I completely agree with. I, I went into industry because I also wanted to do something that did something to, for something. I wanted to make an impact also. Um, I also will say that the reason I got into working with APS and a lot of these committees and started doing education outreach was the same, same rationale and motivation. I wanted to make a difference in something. And at the time, my work, I didn't, a lot of my work projects would end and then another one would start and then it would end. And I didn't feel very um, satisfied by that. And the education part of my uh, work that I started, my education part of my, my career that I started pursuing uh, did satisfy my need to feel like I made a difference in the world. Um, I will also say in terms of a, 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 um, making a, a difference in um, the role in my career path, besides just making an impact, the one thing about industrial jobs is that they're challenging, they're interesting, they're always changing, they're rewarding, and they're expanding in terms of you're always doing something new, you're onto something else. So I think it's a very different uh, collection of of uh, motivations compared to academic research, which is more curiosity driven and developing new knowledge. But anyway, for me, that those all those other aspects were also very motivating. Yeah, Tabitha. And I just wanna add to um, the ideas that Zara, Megan and Larry put forward because all three sort of were able to take that pivot uh, into something that's more applied and something that more they can see the impact to the real world at the stage that they entered their career. But the thing I wanna emphasize is that sometimes this um, making a difference is a matter of retention. It's a matter of whether we're gonna retain the student in the major of physics at the undergraduate level, um, being able to make that connection for them, help them make that connection that, um, that what you're able to do with pursuing a, a physics degree can presently while you're in the curriculum have an impact on the real world 
through maybe some research that's more applied, but also um, in your future, you can have you can have marked impacts. And so um, you mentioned in my bio my involvement with the African Light Source Project. And the fact that Africa is the only habitable continent without a synchrotron light source um, allowed me to actually take the physics and the, the all of the um, all of the uh, fundamental science that I do at Light Sources and translate that into some uh, real world impacts that 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 I think are pretty significant. And so, so these are these were my remarks on. Yeah, thank. Yeah, go, Kathy. So uh, on a personal note, I, if there was not applied physics as an option as a major, I probably would have been an engineer, wow. um, right? That I, I was trying to decide, oh, should I be a physics major, an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer? Oh, what is this applied physics thing? Oh, that works. Um, and now that I'm at a school without engineering, it creates opportunities where students who think they might want to do engineering come to physics. It also means that we very much have students who are motivated by applications, problem solving. I mean, uh, you know, more so than maybe those who find themselves in physics programs if engineering is a concrete other option as a major. Um, so uh, it's something where we actually try to, to bring people into the major partly by a 100 level renewable energy class where it's the no, no, you know, you're taking it through environmental studies, which at our school is very much interdisciplinary humanity, social science, science. Um, and physics can answer these questions. Chemistry can let you work on these questions. So don't, you know, don't write off those majors because you think that they're irrelevant to the environment. Um, we also, um, uh, we have a maker and innovation lab that I'm the director of, and we think about ways of um, helping students realize that a problem they're working on finding a solution to, um, they benefit at least from being on a team with people with technical knowledge in certain fields. Um, and again, we don't have the engineers on campus and sometimes we get them early enough that they might actually change their majors. But you know, we think about different creative ways of helping them understand the type of learning that can then be applied to problems that they know that they care about. Yeah, I, uh, I, I really appreciate Tabitha, how you woven this idea that it's not just about that transition to career, but it's also, about the um, about retention of majors, and so you know, I, I I think Kathy did share some things about the innovation and maker lab and these 100 level courses that that could introduce students to some big picture societal issues where physics can be applied and make a difference. I was just wondering if anyone had any other examples, uh, Tabitha or anyone else. Um, you know, just in terms of like, what were there things in your own experience during the undergraduate curriculum uh, that you had, or or maybe things that you think could be added that would that would make a difference in that way? So I I feel like I just learned a whole lot the and and thought about things I haven't thought about before. So I I think to Kathy's point. Um, my undergraduate institution, Loyola University of Chicago, did not have an engineering program. And so we had a lot of students in the physics major who um, either went on to do a master's in engineering or they had a partnership with um, Washington University to do an, a double uh, bachelor's. Um, so I, I think that probably had an influence in ways that I don't think I've ever thought about before. Um, and then, you know, to Tabitha's point, I think I was um, lucky to have research internships in college at both Argonne and Fermilab um, that helped me see the connection between the degree and the way to apply the knowledge I was building in the classes, um, you know, and to have impact. So I helped build part of one of the detectors at Brookhaven that still operates today, right? And that's something I did. 20 years ago. Um, so, so that I think probably helped me as well. Um, and I'm not sure I had reflected on those experiences in that way before. So I learned something today. And, and I'll just connect um, uh, what Larry was saying about industry and, and, um, and how industry gives you that applied aspect. Um, one of the things that now exists in the curriculum here at Rowan University, and it wasn't quite part of the curriculum where it, when I was in undergraduate school many years ago, is this idea of, um, of the students doing um, um, experiential learning and research experiences as part of their class 
a classroom curriculum. And it's not just uh, an opportunity to do research in the summer or just a single capstone experience. We've actually, our physics department have, has expanded it to uh, two, two full years. So four semesters, um, the students are taking physics research methods is what we call it and it's experiential. But the unique thing is that, um, and they work with a, a faculty member on, on a research project. But the unique thing is that some of these research projects uh, have industry partners, and so um, so the, they're engaging with industry through their through the actual curriculum, and the industry partner is coming in and talking with the students um, to set up the problem. Is present to um, hear the final reports at the end of the semester, and it really just. Uh, uh, can bring it home and bring it into the curriculum. And for us, it's in the last two years, but anything that can be done, I, I'm, I don't have any ideas for the first two years, but it's very important as a matter of retention that the students can really see these uh, connections for some students. Some students are able to push their way through without seeing their connection to the real world uh, problems and making a difference, but, uh, and just simply push their way through. But if you can, if you can show them uh, show them the connections. It's really going to be important for some. Some students won't push their way through, and we'll go into a whole different major. Yeah, yeah. I really, I really appreciate kind of seeing all those different views brought together. The idea that well, it's not exclusively true, but oftentimes industry offers more short-term ways to make an impact or to do something applied. Um, and likewise, if experiential learning opportunities like internships are made accessible to students uh, or industry-sponsored senior design projects or something like that, 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 that is, is sort of an immediate way to kind of get some of that tangible uh, making a difference. And uh, yeah, I think that was really good. Um, so, you know, this is a topic we can continue to, to come back to if more things come up, but I do want to switch back to the slideshow, which you should see now. And um, yeah, so the, the next thing I want to talk about is something that has actually been touched on a little bit. Uh, I think Larry summarized a, a few different things that made working in industry a bit different than maybe his academic experiences, but the idea is that, that can we enrich the culture of physics through a broader community? So thinking about more people are included, more skills are valued. Also the idea of enriching uh, our community through uh, a richer culture. So uh, when comparing your professional experiences that have been both non-academic and academic, can you reflect on differences in culture, values, or expectations? And are there ways that you think the physics community could specifically benefit from these broader experiences? And I think, you know, part of this would speak to like maybe why keep physicists who go off into different career paths, why keep them connected into the broader physics community? Well, part of the answer, you know, may be something to do with this. Uh, you know, if there are lessons that we can learn to make our community as a whole richer. So I'd you know, love to hear what your thoughts are. I'll defer to someone else since I'm still in the academic setting. So that non-academic setting, I'm curious to hear. Um, I'll, I'll go. Um, so um, I think one of the key aspects that is very different in industry than in university, at least when you're a grad student, I mean, there's a definite hierarchy of, of, of folks there, right? The professor, and then it's the postdocs, and then it's the senior graduate students, and it's the early graduate students, and maybe the undergraduates. But in a company, I think there's a clear recognition that every single person has a critical role to play from technician to program manager, to finance, to contracts. And I, I just was at a, an all company, all hands meeting today. I wanna to read you some of the quotes that I took because I thought they were very relevant to this particular part of, the, uh, of this uh, meeting. So this is what our senior vice president that, are, that is in charge of our group said today to all of his employees talking about uh, you know, kind of how the whole year is going and what the future looks like. Everyone's effort is needed to make this a reality. I love you all equally. Everyone has a different motivation for doing their job and it takes a village to run a company. So I think that really reflects on, you know, the importance that everyone is viewed in a company. And it's a, even though there's a hierarchy there, 
I think for a successful company, there's a recognition that everyone plays an equally valid and important and you know critical role in making the company work and developing the products on time and, and working on and making projects successful. I want to add to that. So I think in addition to the hierarchy, I think another big difference I saw in my experiences between academia and industry um, is that in academia, there is this focus on the individual um, where the individual has to get their name on papers and the individual gives talks at conferences. And to me, industry has always felt much more collaborative um, rather than competitive um, in that, like, you know, the entire company is working towards a shared goal. And it's not that, like, I need to get my research published before theirs. You know, it's just I need to do my work so they can do theirs. Um, and I, I really love that collaboration. Yeah, so I think maybe those. to offer sort of a slightly different viewpoint on, on some of the those different aspects. So there's some things that I've come to appreciate that I got out of my, my physics education and particularly my um, dissertation work uh, at Fermilab, where working with a large distributed global multicultural um, group of people to get things done, right, where actually hierarchy really wasn't there. So the people I worked with day in, day out were not my, you know, it was not Northwestern University people. It wasn't my advisor on a day-to-day -day basis. It was people who were paid by completely different institutions who had no reason to listen to me. So the idea of learning how to influence without formal authority was a skill I had to start building. And that's been a hugely useful skill in uh, the remainder of my career as well, right? And still is today, even though there are corporate hierarchies, a lot of the way I need to get things done is through and with others. And I try to only use formal authority when it's really necessary and instead use, you know, sort of informal authority and, and influencing as a way to help get things done. Um, I think, you know, the obvious of sort of global distribution, working virtually and distributed, that's now obvious today, but that's not a skill that most people came into the corporate world with. Um, so I've actually been at an advantage through the last couple of years uh, compared to many of my colleagues who have struggled to figure out how to form um, successful collaborative working relationships when they're not physically in an office with people. Um, I think one of the other big differences um, that's, that's obvious but probably just worth saying for the sake of it is that um, working in for a company, the goal is to help the company make money. So that is the purpose, right? And you might all be sort of uh, united around uh, some of the particular projects or initiatives around how to help make that happen. Um, you know, but to Zara's point, it is both, it can be both more collaborative, um, but it also forces you to think about what's necessary to accomplish versus what's a nice to have and how do you sort of stick to doing what's needed to solve the problem to the level of precision required and then move on to the next problem. Um, whereas at least I felt in grad school, a lot of the time it was to solve the problem to the ultimate level of precision um, rather than to the level of precision necessary before moving on. Um, so just a couple of thoughts from, from my perspective that are perhaps a bit different. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I, the, reflecting on the very different um, kind of institutional culture that a place like Fermilab might have versus you know, a, a smaller scale experimental or theoretical group is, is fascinating to think how, how the, you know, the Fermilab experience really positioned you well with that uh, multinational collaborative effort. Uh, I, I did want to come back to just one thing you said, you know, so uh, I think it was just the, the previous question we were looking at was thinking about making a difference and, and making an impact and that there were sort of shorter term ways to do that. Uh, and, uh, but then th there was also this line you had, Megan, that I, it was something like, you know, the goal is to help the company make money. Uh, so, you know, how, how do you, how do you reconcile that? Cause I, I think there is this sense that, that maybe some people have that they're selling out, you know, uh, by, by, yeah. by doing that. And so, so but, but, you know, you seem to kind of hold both of those things together in, in some sort of happy way. So what's the secret? Yeah, so I, um, I, I think there's a couple of ways to think about it. So one is if I use sort of my current industry around people analytics, um, people analytics is a very difficult set of problems, right? It's not, there isn't sort of like a final measurement that will hold true for all future data. Um, it's also fraught with um, 
lots of potential pitfalls. I think here what we're trying to do is to say we could use algorithms to help actually remove some of the bias that exists in the way that human recruiters make decisions about who to consider for a role. So if I can use algorithms to help give them better information or more accurate information, help them make less biased decisions, I am improving the outcomes for the careers of the people involved and for the hiring manager and the company. That in turn helps my company be better at what we do, um, which is predominantly executive search, so sort of headhunting for corporate executives, um, and, and in turn would help our company make money, because if we're better at what we do, more people will hire us to do this thing. Um, so I don't think that they have to live sort of in opposite places, right? I, I think there, you can find commonality. Um, I think similarly in my insurance world, um, a lot of the work I was doing was around improving algorithms around insurance pricing. Um, so why then is your car insurance different than the cost of my car insurance? What about us as drivers means that I'm a more expensive driver? Is it the kind of car or the type of driver I am? So the idea, again, nobody thinks of insurance companies, right? They're sort of, it's the product nobody wants to buy, never wants to use, but has to have. Um, yet, I think there's ways to bring the skill set of sort of algorithm development and analytics in a way that actually helps make things more fair. Um, so that's how I hold those things together. Um, and, and I think you can find that regardless of industry or potential path. And I'm sure others um, on the panel have their own experiences as well. Uh, um, thank you all for those responses uh, for, for this uh, non-academic perspective. I wanted to tackle the second question, which is, are there ways that the physics community culture could benefit from these broader experiences? And there was one thing that Megan said that really resonated with me in terms of um, solving problems uh, to the ultimate level of precision versus solving them to actually reach the goal because that's what um, industry's focus is. And where we can circle back to the um, training of physicists at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level is applying that to our teaching them how to communicate uh, what they're working on um, in the lab uh, when they're in their research experiences. And so what you'll find is that the students, when um, asked to, to spontaneously describe sort of what they're doing and that, you know, we try to train them with that three minute elevator pitch so that they start to learn how to focus in on what the important um, concepts are. But if, you, if without that sort of a, a design to, uh, to their training, they will go into the ultimate level of detail as they're explaining the project. And so if we apply these ideas that, that come from the non-academic setting to just teaching them how to communicate their, their physics um, problem, then I think that would be one way to translate it. So I hope that, I hope I didn't go into the ultimate level of precision with, my, with that particular response. It looks like Kathy wants to jump in with something. Yeah, thanks Tabitha. So um, I, I, two things struck me when listening to everyone when talk about it. Um, uh, one is immediately response of, I have a lot of fun in electronics class because electronics is often allowed as part of the physics curriculum of, no, actually if it functions, it's okay, <laughs> right? Like uh, we're defining success by did it do it did it do its job to the the, to the parameters that we said it had to do its job. Um, so there are places in the curriculum um, and in research, right? Like when do you when is good enough good enough to make progress? Um, but uh, I, I mean, I think what me what I feel like I need to say out loud is um, the I spend a lot of time thinking about the undergraduate physics experience and the definition of success. The feedback that students get is so narrow. Um, did you get a good grade because you did problem sets? Um, maybe you did a lab write-up and there's communication built into it. Um, uh, you know, maybe there's presentations built, but like it's still very traditional. Um, are you good at school? Um, not, are you going to be really great on a team working on some large or small task, which you do, you get to that to varying degrees in, in grad school. You get, you know, pieces of this here and there, but the number of students I've had who are having sort of huge you know, crises of confidence who don't know how they would possibly ever get a job because look at all these A students and they're just the B students. So how could they possibly contribute to anything? Um, and why would they ever get hired first? And they don't understand that they have uh, like all of the, 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 um, 
qualities and experiences that you've been talking about, um, contributing to a team and, and being having immense potential leadership on a team for being able to have a, a different sets of skills that carry over perhaps better into other environments, also just higher, farther along even in academic career that also makes a difference. But I, I sorry, that was a little rambly, but, um, but we, right, doing well on problem sets and exams is so far from anything that I heard anyone just talk about. And yet that's what students get their self-worth self -worth from. And if I can just piggyback on that, Kathy, I think um, what you highlighted is hugely important. And when I'm hiring for entry-level roles, right? So for people fresh out of undergraduate or a master's, um, maybe a PhD, part of what I'm looking for is somebody who, um, who has struggled before because a lot of the work we do is challenging and challenging in different ways. Um, and uh, my, uh, my family reminded me last night actually that I used to say, I don't wanna hire someone who has never failed before because they're going to fail because everybody fails. And if the first time you fail is when you're working for me, that means I have to teach you how to fail successfully. I don't have time to teach you that. I want you to have already been through at least one experience like that so that you have some level of resilience to push through. I can teach you all the other things, right? The coding language, the industry knowledge, the whatever it is, but for you to have struggled and moved on in some way, whether that was giving up and moving to something different or pushing through and ultimately being successful is hugely important because everybody does that all the time. Um, and so I, I think, that's a, what you're describing, I think, is super important um, because I actually don't want the 4.0 GPA student who has a perfect record and has done everything 100% right their entire student career because they're going to struggle more when they start running into roadblocks um, when they get into their first job. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Larry, yeah. I know you were also. Yeah, I totally agree with Kathy and Megan and, 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 and the, um, I mean, the, the truth is that doing most of my undergraduate career was doing problem sets at the end of the chapter, which is something that I really never had to do in industry. I mean, you're doing something unique and different, and it has all sorts of aspects to it. But the fact that you're graded on something that is a skill that, yes, there's a, a, some of it's useful, but much of it is not relevant to what your day-to-day -day life is going to be in industry. And yet that's, that's how you build your physics sense of worth is by your grades. So yeah, there's a, there's a major disconnect there that I, I wanted to bring out another point, Ben, that you mentioned about, uh, you know, how do you reconcile making money with making a difference in industry? And in fact, I mean, most of us aren't CEOs, right? So really most of our, our work company involves a project. And in many ways, we're no different than a university professor who gets a budget from the NSF to do a certain amount of research and train graduate students and has to show at the end of their at the end of their NSF contract that they did some research and published some papers and, you know, they had, they had productivity uh, and they, they did what they said they were going to do. In the same way, you know, we have projects at work where we have budgets and we're supposed to get something done. And at the end of the project, you know, hopefully you, you did what you said you were going to do and you did it in the budget that you got. So, I mean, there's a lot of similarities there. And I really don't think there's much of an issue of reconciling, making a difference with making money for your company. It's really about doing a project successfully and, and, you know, doing what you said you were going to do and being a responsible, productive member of your company and, and someone you can someone you get along with other people as well. Yeah, thanks, Larry. I, uh, I, you know, as a couple of comments here centered around the nature of assessment, in, you know, which is not unique to physics. I mean, uh, grades and exams are, are pretty common in most disciplines. Uh, but but it, it did strike me that, you know, say, Kathy, the work you're doing with the innovation and maker space, uh, you know, that, that there's an element of that whole maker movement, which is about producing things that you can personally appreciate, take with you, and that others can appreciate. And, uh, and, and so that idea of like constructing things that can be shared and, and appreciated is so different than I think, uh, you know, the, the result of getting a grade where in the end, once you got that good grade, you don't really care any thing about that exam ever again. It's just done check mark. Uh, and, and so the idea of like, you know, are there ways to build into the curriculum, uh, the, these more shareable things that matter, uh, you know, longer term after the exam is over, say. Yeah, it, it's a comment slash question. So if no one feels like they want to respond to that, that's totally fine. 
I mean, I guess I'll say, um, I wish I wish we had more faculty within our physics department that we could do even more creative courses because we ended up we always end up turning back and saying all right we're barely covering the minimum that that one would expect. Um, uh, so I have tons of creative examples of how you can do this in in as one offs um, in lots of other fields actually. Um, but I think you're also getting at um, the the really nice thing about projects. And they don't have to be tangible, physical, point to it and be proud of it. Um, but the really great thing about projects is there's so much more flexibility in how one can choose to grade um, because you you can, if you really devote a lot of time to iterations and the idea of failure and pivoting, um, you know, there are a number of people who grade based on um, engagement effort where you're coming up with a, a a concrete rubric that students aren't going to push back on um, is still, I think, a challenge, but um, uh, but that it's not the right or wrong that you end up with, nor is it just the, all right, you wrote a paper draft and then you wrote a revision of that paper draft, but whether, um, uh, you know, my electronics class has the most flexibility in this, right? So what kind of projects can you do at the end? And I go back and forth on content versus like a substantial project. Uh, so there are there are spaces for it, especially if you have um, the flexibility to be more creative in the type of classes that you offer. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for those perspectives, everyone. Um, I'm going to jump back to the slideshow and put up our next topic. So, oh, so uh, so I wanted to just put up this is this is a quote from a student of mine from a few years back, and you know, the student said uh, sent me an email said, "Hey, prof." Sorry, I haven't emailed you sooner. It's been a hectic week for me. I just wanted you to know that the interview went really well on Thursday, so well that they offered me a job working as an engineer, and I did not make up that many exclamation points. That was that was original to the student. Thank you so much for everything you've done. If it weren't for you, I never would have taken the first tour of the company. So this was a student I'd had in a class. We did like a, a tour in a related industry to the course content, and the student went on to work in that company for several years. And uh, you know, I. Uh, but the student was just so excited. It was just a, a moment of immense pride and, and significance. It was like the culmination of their physics degree uh, really meaning something. And so I, I wanted to come to this question, which is a reflection on entering work. And so in your own experience, um, you know, I think this is relevant to academia or industry, but in your own experience, or, you know, you might even have uh, students that like I do that, that have great stories, uh, you know, what was the significance of getting that first job? And particularly this idea of having stable, financially rewarding work. Uh, and, and what role did that play in career decisions? So uh, that's, that's where we're gonna take it next. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I guess on, on the, the second point, maybe, um, so I did a webinar a number of years back for APS that was about how I got a six-figure job coming out of grad school. So mine is no secret, right? It's been out there for ages. Um, having a, a stable um, job that was uh, going to help me financially was very important. I have other goals and other parts of myself and my life that exist outside of the work that I do. Um, that are very important to me. And at the time, um, in order to achieve some things I wanted to in my personal life, I needed to have a certain level of income to be able to do those things. Uh, and so it was important to me. And, and then also, frankly, to be paid fairly for my level of education uh, and the skills that I brought to the table. So I did a lot of work with uh, Northwestern's Career Services Department uh, in understanding what the right sort of salary ranges would be and what different salary ranges for different um, kinds of career paths I could pursue. Uh, and they also helped me in my job offer negotiation. Um, and, and that was really, that was important to me um, for a number of reasons. Uh, so the stability is sort of the reliability, um, the financial aspect of it um, were all important components, plus actually doing and, and being able to do that and do work that was interesting and challenging and um, rewarding, right, to sort of have the whole package um, was pretty awesome. Yeah, thanks. I can, I can talk. Mike. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Tabitha. 
Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my own personal experiences. I would say that throughout my um, graduate schooling and all the way through my PhD, I had a lot of um, anxiety surrounding the topic of whether I would be um, able to support myself at, as a scientist, as a uh, at the time, I wasn't thinking of myself as a physicist, um, but um, but and and that level of anxiety, I, I remember it was a hugely um, stressful time, and it was extremely protracted. I mean, from almost the beginning throughout, and I was always uh, wondering, am I going to be, you know, um, n you know, uh, just uh, not using my not using my education at all, and that that's a scary thought. Um, so I guess what I want to um, round it out to is just giving um, young people or, or even the, the, the leaders here the idea that you should give your young people the perspective that um, they as long as they're open in terms of the, the, uh, the, the t ranges of options that they have uh, with, a, with a physics degree, all the way from, um, from uh, optometrist all the way to um, in the in medical doctors if they're coming out of undergrad or even pivoting into that um, they if they, as long as they can stay open uh, they can you can maybe help them avoid a lot of anxiety and so I'll, I'll leave it at that yeah and just to clarify Tabitha like was that anxiety from like the beginning of undergrad through postdoc or like when no did it was it only after I um but once I decided to enter graduate school I think I was sort of like wide open uh to uh various career fields and I do think that I'm glad you asked the clarifying question um it was only after I went into graduate school that it seemed as though the only path forward was to to success was to become a researcher and um and, and so, so that's where, when the anxiety uh, began, but it, throughout the undergrad, you know, before I was sort of locked into this one, one thought, one pathway, um, I don't think that anxiety level existed at that point. So, so again, it, it really goes back to this idea of, of making sure that your students know that there are these broad career pathways and they're very good careers that are not just you know, going in and becoming a professor and, and it's opening a research lab and so forth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, I, I think my story is probably pretty typical. I mean, I, I love physics for me being when I was a young kid in astronomy. And, uh, you know, I did, you know, undergraduate and after undergraduate, you go to grad school, right? And after grad school, you get a postdoc and you keep putting out this decision, like, what am I really going to do? Right. So, and I really didn't have much of an idea. I was going from postdoc one to postdoc two when I got a job offer from my company, General Atomics. And I thought, wow, a job, that's great. So, I mean, I took the job and it was a very ill-defined job in the beginning, um, but it's, it's led to a 40 year career there. And, you know, working on many, many, many different projects in many different areas and being challenged in all sorts of different ways. Um, so anyway, that's my story, but I do want to point a shout out to, you know, at, at the time that I was doing this, there was no career advice that your professor could give you. APS didn't have any career advice. And I want to, you know, a shout out to Crystal and her team and APS for things like all the careers website, the AIP, you know, um, you know, handbook. Yeah. Thank you, Crystal. Um, you know, there's now the FIS 21 report. There's so much information on how to train students or what, what education, you know, what, what, what skills and knowledge are needed for students to succeed in industry. What, you know, there's, there's examples of career paths in industry. There's so much more now that there was. So we have come a long way. Yeah, thanks for that perspective over time. Uh, yeah, Crystal, do you wanna uh, contribute something? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think now would be a really good time to do that. And my cat just, barged his way in here so there could be a cat involved here momentarily but um just quickly i wanted to let folks know because there have been some questions i think a lot of people are really interested in you know broadening uh what they can offer their students in terms of thinking about career paths they just don't know what the resources are so i'll mention a couple really quickly you know the aps careers website we have a library of physicist profiles working in all kinds of different areas. We have a set of profiles on different career pathways, types of careers, not just individuals, but where, you, like what is a sales and marketing career look like for somebody with a physics degree? What about uh, R&D and industry? Um, teaching all kinds of things. 
Um, so that's just explore our website. There's a lot of stuff there. We just did a webinar series, Success in Industry Careers. That's available. You can also find it on our website. It, it's on YouTube. Anybody can watch it. You don't have to be an APS member to access that. Um, and a lot of different webinars on career paths. Um, someone was asking, where do I find internships? So the APS Job Board, um, which is a, we partner with Physics Today and all kinds of different scientific societies. If you go to careers.aps.org and click on the internships tab, it'll show you all of the current internships. And there aren't a lot right now because it's January, but as you get closer to summer, you'll see a lot of stuff pop up, uh, opportunities in industry. We also have a careers guide that we just published um, that has a bunch of employers in the back who hire physicists. Go to their websites, look at what they uh, are offering there. There's all kinds of opportunities. And if this is too much information, just email me. I'm always here to help you. We do have a lot of resources. I obviously take this very, very seriously um, and want to do what I can to help uh, you find these, these opportunities for your students. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. So uh, I, I think this is a good time. We've got about 12 minutes left in the panel. And I want to switch to our last uh, topic that I think tie some of these things together. So this is linking this broader discussion to diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And our discussion so far is focused on things like who gets recognized as a physicist, what skills and abilities are valued, what motivations are encouraged, what needs might that physics degree satisfy, and how might the culture of physics broaden. And many of those things overlap with these recommendations we looked at from the team up report at the very beginning. And uh, so, you know, I would definitely encourage you to look at that team up report because many of the recommendations that will support African American students in physics, they're going to support all students and, uh, but they're going to make a particularly powerful impact on the students from underrepresented backgrounds. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I am uh, very grateful for one of the, the co-authors of the team up report, Tabitha Dobbins, uh, to, to be here with us to, to, you know, also just share a perspective from that. And so, you know, I, you know, this is really where we're, we're rounding out these, um, our conversation today is, uh, is this. And so I, I would like, uh, you know, just to hear from the whole panel and, and Tabitha and hear questions from the, uh, from the audience on this topic as well. So, um, yeah, what is the, what is the overlap between these topics? I guess I'll get started. And I would say that, um, really, um, emphasizing the physics identity of the students early on. It doesn't have to come um, after they get the title of physicist uh, in, a, in, a, in a job. It can come early on when they're, when they're first engaging with, um, for example, uh, going out and, and doing demos, doing physics demos as part of the physics club. They can identify themselves and you can help them identify themselves as a physicist from, the, from there. And then I'll just round it out by saying um, also keeping uh, into their into their scope, into their view that the uh, list of careers that they can pursue after the bachelor's degree in physics is really wide open and that these are really engaging and wonderful careers. Um, and, and even uh, at the graduate level, uh, it's still emphasizing that the um, path forward after graduate school doesn't have to be narrowly focused on what that what the professors in the department are, what their careers are. And so um, really that it's going to be so critical to to keep that in scope for for inclusion and, and for underrepresented populations for first generation students who may not know what to do with a physics degree or their STEM degree. So I'll pass it to the other panelists from here. Yeah, thank you, Tabitha. I'd like, um, so I just wanna add on to what Crystal said that the EP3 guide, which a, a lot of the EP3 guide is now out, there's a section on careers, which um, uh, Crystal was part of that. And I, I was as well, that is, uh, has a compendium of a lot on careers also for undergraduate departments. And I will also agree with, with Tabitha that there's also a section that I've been working on on community engagement and the importance of that for developing student identities 
That's another section in the EP3 guide that will probably be out within the next couple of months. Yeah, I mean, you know, coming back to the, oh, Zara, were you going to say something? Okay. Yeah, so Tabitha, uh, I wanted to come back to this issue you brought up early, just because, I mean, it is, uh, I was shocked to hear this story of how it took you so long in your career path to consider yourself a physicist. And to me, it seems like that's a problem, right? It, it seems like that is not a healthy situation for our community. And it's sad that there wasn't enough like affirmation uh, that would have led you to that conclusion far earlier in your career. And so, you know, I was wondering, you know, what what do you want it to look like at Rowan? What do, what do you want it to look like for your students in terms of when they would start to consider themselves a physicist to, to not, you know, kind of perpetuate this, this identity crisis for, for years <laughs> after graduation? So what do you think that should look like? I think from from the day that they uh, sort of step into the door at the first day of freshman year, uh, having selected physics as their intended major is the day that they define themselves as a physicist, I would say, or that we define them as a physicist and that we, we talk to them that way. And, 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 and we, that, that shows that we uh, expect them to complete the degree. That's one thing it, it, so it, it aims at, at retention, it, but it, it aims at this. Um, the other theme out of the team up report is this sense of belonging. And so you can hand them uh, that sense of belonging by, um, by considering them to be a physicist from, from the earliest part of their, um, of their career, that, that we fully expect them to finish. We fully expect them to carry this um, title with them for the rest of their lives when, you know, when they do finish the degree. Yeah, that's, a, I think, a, a really helpful perspective. It, it makes me think of, uh, you know, the department as a community. And when a student enters that community, the question is, are they sort of welcomed into the community as a member, like you are a physicist, or are you uh, kind of on a conditional basis? Only once you prove yourself to some level, then you can be one of us. And uh, yeah, I think there is a lot of tension in our physics community right now about, about where do we stand and like, you know, what, what bar has to be met. And, uh, you know, it, it certainly seems like to, to make physics a, a much more welcoming and diverse field that, that uh, lots of things point to, uh, you know, embracing your recommendations. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing those. Uh, you know, I, I was likewise curious, uh, Kathy, if, if you're willing to share anything from your perspective at Mount Holyoke and with, you know, this focus on innovation and making and, and, you know, oftentimes those things are tied to de developing a sense of belonging in a department and, and retention of majors. Uh, yeah. I, do you see any space for overlap here? Um, I, I mean, I think the more ways you give students to, um, show their uh, knowledge, dedication, interests, passions. Um, you're allowing for lots of different expressions of identity. Um, I think Tabitha said, I, I have nothing to add after Tabitha uh, talked about stuff like great, uh, I 100% agree, glad you said it so well. Um, you know, the, the um, we worked really hard on creating a physical space where all feel welcome. Um, as a traditionally women's college, we have sort of the huge advantage that we're not immediately dominated by uh, the traditional makers. So um, we also benefited by taking over a former dining hall um, kitchen that has floor to ceiling windows overlooking a lake, um, right? So come, come visit. Um, so we are training our student mentors. We also have peer mentor, like, so our student workers are peer mentors. We have peer mentoring programs in other uh, uh, departments that um, go through uh, DEI training. Um, and, you know, the adding creativity um, where, again, the evaluation and the way people think about um, success is so different than your typical classroom. Um, it just allows for individuality in a way that I don't see in most other spaces in the curriculum. Um, I probably yeah. could talk for another hour, but I'm gonna leave it there. Okay, whoa, 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 we only got four more minutes. So uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, that reflection. Uh, uh, Crystal, um, 
anything you want to say? I mean, we are nearing the end. Uh, I would like to give our panelists like a, a final chance to say a word, but I know you might have a question. Well, gosh, we have gotten so many questions actually. Uh, but I think that some of them, uh, it's been a very rich discussion and I hope people feel like some of the questions that were posed were sort of answered in the, in the context. Um, one that I thought was really interesting was the question whether physics would benefit from an accrediting body like ABET. And I don't know if it, that might be more than we can talk about in four minutes, but Larry, go ahead. <laughs> that was the motivation of the EP3 report because it was a discussion about do departments want to be accredited or do they want a set of best practices? So that really was the motivation for developing the six year effort that is the EP3 you know, set of uh, best pra effective practices. I did link to the EP3 report as an announcement if folks want to click over. It's specifically to the career section, but you can find your way to the rest of the report from there. Um, there, there are some other great questions, but I, I don't think we're going to have time to meaningfully delve into any of them. So, uh, Ben, I'll go ahead and just turn it back over to you. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the great questions, everyone. I hope you feel like we got to some of what you were asking about. Yeah, and I would say one thing is, uh, you know, Crystal and I, we, we can copy and paste all those great questions into uh, some document and keep them as fodder for, you know, future uh, webinars that, that perhaps APS could run. So uh, if, if there's other other questions. So, but I would like to give, so we've got two last minutes. I mean, any final words from the panelists that just things that you'd really like to uh, share or express before we go? I, I've enjoyed um, the discussion over the last 90 minutes and, and yeah, thank you. And I've enjoyed hearing from the other panelists about their experiences. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tabitha. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate everyone here. Uh, I thank you for taking the time uh, to provide your, your kind of feedback on the questions and the discussion ahead of time. I thank you for all who are listening in the audience um, in uh, 30 minutes and half an hour. Uh, there will be the APS Medal and Society Prize Ceremony. So you can uh, take a, a little break and then join up with that in half an hour. So uh, thank you so much to all. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Zara. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Tabitha. Really appreciate everything. Uh, maybe unmute. We can just all say bye to each other and uh, wish you the best on the rest of your day. Thanks for the invitation, Ben. And, and Thanks, Ben. Great job. Okay. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, great. Yeah. Bye. Okay.